This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode 256, recorded on December 2nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you happy, doing? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy, happy winter, right? Thank you. Well, in San Diego, we don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Yes, where we had about three inches of snow uh, Saturday wow. night, and today it's going to be in the mid-50s. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway. Pretty weird. Crazy. It's going to melt away. The day we got the snow was the day Michigan beat Ohio State. Oh. I was wondering if you were going to comment on that. It's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. <laughs> Oh, very good. And from Huge Charleston, deal. South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. It's a beautiful 72 degrees here. We have Chamber of Commerce sunny weather, so all is good until it snows this week or something. Yeah, it, it, the temperature is, <laughs> is highly variable. It's weird. It's yeah. a weird, weird world. Oh, well. Let's get down to some science, but first I have a few announcements. Throughout November, well, November's over. Forget that. Throughout December <laughs> and January, all donations made to uh, my colleague Daniel Griffin's organization, Parasites Without Borders, uh, he will match and hand back to us Microbe TV. So go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click, scroll down a little. There's a little button that says Donate. Uh, and your donations are tax deductible because that is a 501c3. and Microbe TV a few weeks ago was granted 501c3 status or status. So now all your donations to Great. us are federal U.S. tax deductible. And so if you are donating to us on Patreon or PayPal, you can now deduct it from your income tax. And you can you can support us at microbe.tv slash contribute. So we have two papers today. We we skipped Thanksgiving. So now we're, we're three weeks downstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's get into the science. And I am going to lead off with a snippet, which Michael sent to me. And I immediately said, I need to do this. And TWIM is fine for viruses. It's a virus paper. It's an eLife. It's called Dengue Genetic Divergence Generates Within Serotype Antigenic Variation. But serotypes dominate evolutionary dynamics. And this is from Sidney Bell, Leah Katzelnik, and Trevor Bedford. Now, Trevor Bedford should be a household name. Uh, he's the guy up in uh, at the at the hutch up there in Washington, Seattle, who uh, first picked up uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections because he was doing influenza screening, and he said, "Let's mm. sequence these and see what else is in these samples." And that's how he found that there were plenty of infections already last January, January 2020, of SARS-CoV-2 before anyone else knew it. And since then, he's been very active. But that's not his main field. He's an evolutionary uh, geneticist, and that's reflected in this paper today. And so I decided to do this on on Twim uh, because it's an important issue that actually impacts on some work that we're doing. Uh, in my lab, Amy Rosenfeld, with polio and other enteroviruses. So dengue virus is a flavivirus. That family, by the way, was named after yellow fever virus because when you get yellow fever virus, it infects your liver and you get jaundiced where your eyes, the whites of your eyes can turn yellow. So flavi, flavus is Latin for yellow. Uh, but uh, these are enveloped plus stranded RNA viruses. Some of them are uh, arthropod born, this this mosquito born, uh, a dengue virus, of course, is is uh, transmitted among humans by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, and um, this is a big deal. Uh, there is uh, there are four hundred million cases known a year, mainly in South America, Southeast Asia, and this paper deals with the antibody response that results. It's actually timely for SARS CoV two and COVID as well. There are four serotypes of dengue, 
All right. What is a serotype? People always ask me, what is a serotype? The serotype is actually kind of an old term now, which people don't use much anymore because in the old days, you would, uh, let's do it with polio, right? Polio is isolated in 1906. And if you got infected with polio, you still could get it. And it turned out there were two other types of polio that did not, uh, would infect you, even though you're infected with one of the three. And that's what we call a serotype, something that uh, where antibodies against one does not protect you against uh, infection or disease with the other. And it's it's so in the old days, it's, yeah. It's not such a bad term. I don't mind at all. I, I have no problem with the term, but nowadays nobody wants to make antibodies. They just look at the sequence and they say, this is a new serotype. <laughs> they call them genotypes now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the old days, you would take a virus, inject it into a rabbit, get the antibodies, and then try to neutralize different isolates. And you'd say, oh, this, these are not neutralized. So it's a different serotype. And there are four serotypes of dengue virus. And he calls them clades because that's a, that's a genomics term. <laughs> clades based on a phylogenetic tree. And he says, canonically thought of as serotypes. He's giving lip service to the... <laughs> to the he's giving lip service to the immunologist. That's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Now, the thing about dengue is you get your... Let's say you're infected for the first time. Um it can often be a mild disease, although in some cases you get joint pain, severe joint pain and headache, and it can be quite severe. Um, but then you can get reinfected because there are three other serotypes and they're all circulating. Um, and it's that second infection that then gives you a good immunity so you won't get infected anymore. But after the first one, it tends to, the, the immune response tend to, tends to contract after six months to two years. But the problem is, let's say you're infected with dengue one. And then at some point in the future, you get infected with dengue too. You could have a horrible disease. You could have antibody-dependent enhancement, which results in hemorrhage and bleeding, and you could die. Uh, these are these are one to three percent of these cases progress to what's called severe dengue. Nine thousand deaths every year. So what's going on is that the if you were infected with type one dengue and then you get infected with type two, your your memory responses against type one. And those antibodies will bind type 2, but they won't block infection of cells. And therefore, those viruses can get taken up into macrophages and other cells, other immune cells with FC receptors. And so now the virus has an expanded tropism, plus all these immune cells getting infected releases cytokines, and that gives you the severe disease. So we do need to have a better understanding of the immunology uh, of dengue here. And that's what this paper does, is try to understand what is a serotype and does anything happen within a genotype, uh, within a serotype? Is there any variation? So there's some suggestion that there's a little bit of antigenic variation within serotypes and they have, uh, that's supported by observations. There's one outbreak in Peru, for example, where there were outbreaks in two seasons with two different genotypes of dengue 2. So this is weird. You're supposed to be protected if you get dengue 2 and then get reinfected, but apparently not. So they wanted to look and see, is there variation within the serotype? And this is important for other viruses. So the viruses that we work on, enteroviruses, classically thought to exist as serotypes, three serotypes of polio, many of the others just one serotype. But we're finding variation within the serotypes and, in fact, some cross-reactivity, uh, which they also found here. So I, I found this paper really interesting with respect to our work. So what they do is they have a nice collection of sera. Uh, they have um, they have sera from non-human primates that they infected experimentally uh, with the four serotypes of dengue. And then they draw sera from those animals and they can use, they will use that in this study. And then they also have uh, 31 people who they actually infected with a vaccine strain of dengue virus. So the NIH is developing a vaccine uh, against dengue. There's already one license, but it has some issues. So NIH has what I think is a better one. And you can actually 
infect people with it. It doesn't cause any disease. So they have sera from those people as well, and they can use them both. And in fact, they find the results from the non-human primates and the humans are, are quite similar. So they have 454 non-human primate sera and 728 uh, human sera. Now, I have to say one thing. They use the word titered. We titered this sera. I have to say, folks, titer is a noun. It is not a verb. You can't make it a verb. You got to <laughs> stop doing that. All right. It's a little pedantic, but I've always been taught. My my mentor has told me titer is a verb, uh, a noun, not a verb. Here I so go. Is it determine the titer. Determine the titer. Yes, that's exactly it. The determine virus titer. Determine the titer. Or you could say titrate, right? Because titrate is a verb. Yes. But titer. But you know, I noticed then. Writing, people ignore definitions. They ignore what's meant. And I guess that simply means I'm getting old. Okay. <laughs> no, it just means that you were properly instructed. Well, that Norms would imply change that these over time. It's not been... sad but true. Yeah, but I'd like them to stay a prop, proper to the definition, right? Uh, anyway, uh, so what they do is take all these sera – and do neutralization assays. What that means is you mix the serum with virus, and then you infect cells, and you ask, is the infection blocked? What kind and of cells is this? Sorry? What kind of cells are we talking about? Oh, that that's a good question. I don't know. It's, uh, let's, let me look in the methods and see uh, what kind of cells. Some cell line, most likely, because it doesn't really matter, because the antibody, um, right, is binding sure. to the virus. Yeah. Let's look. Okay, data, <laughs> tighter model, <laughs> uh, population immunity. Uh, boy, are they going to tell us? No, they don't tell us how they do the, okay. how they do the cell culture assay. No, no. So it's some cell in culture that is, you know, permissive and susceptible to dengue virus. So they find that, in fact, the the greatest, the highest neutralization titers are against the same serotype, right? So if if the non-human primate was immunized with dengue one, the highest neutralization is with against dengue one. But there's also some weaker neutralization against the other serotypes. It's so like everything else in biology, it's never black and white, right? They're always gray edges. So, and they have a figure that shows this, which is quite nice because the intensity of the neutralization is shown by a color, and you can really see the homotypic neutralization. That means the antibodies against the same Serotype are stronger than cross serotype. So, uh, homotypic virus serum pairs are more closely related antigenically than heterotypic pairs, but they find a lot of variation around this uh, between serotypes. So, they say, and I like this sentence treating each serotype as antigenically uniform potentially overlooks important antigenic heterogeneity across viruses within each serotype. So, that may make a difference. It may you know, as we saw, it could cause an outbreak within the same serotype. Uh, then they say, okay, are these, are these um, neutralization patterns caused by the gene sequence? It should be, right? But they do, they do say that neutralization assays are variable. So let's make sure that it correlates. So they have the, the sequences and the gene that's involved here encodes uh, the envelope like a protein, which for dengue and other flavors is called E for envelope. It's not called spike as, as it is for coronaviruses. It's called E for envelope, which I like um, because it's an envelope protein. And they look at the sequence and they correlate the sequence with the neutralization patterns that they've already established uh, in, in this um, previous study. And they can see the changes, the amino acid changes that uh, associate with the serotype differences and with the interserotype differences. And the, the changes go all across E and they correlate with changes, not just across serotypes, but within serotype. And I want to make another pedantic comment. So <laughs> they call changes in E, amino acid changes in E mutations. They're not mutations. Mutations are a nucleotide sequence. But everybody misuses that now. I feel like I've got a lost, lost cause here. <laughs> So, no, I just I'll, I'll jump like, on that. I'll defend that one. They're not a mutation. It's a substitution. 
Yeah, it's an amino acid change or substitution, whatever you want. If you go yeah. in the old literature, you'll find that. Anyway, um, so um, then they say, can we measure the uh, antigenic difference between any pair of viruses? Can we make a model that does that? And they, they actually do that. And um, they say we, we can find um, mutations that explain the, the antigenic differences among these viruses and can predict uh, neutralization. Uh, differences. And so they conclude that there is underlying genetic differences that support these serotype and within serotype differences. So all this so far is in cells and culture, right? What about the real world? What do mm -hmm. we see? And that's really what we want to know about, right? So they say, you know, I mean, and this is important. If antigenic variation is useful to the virus, then it would confer a fitness advantage. A fitness advantage, okay? This is exactly what the variants are of SARS-CoV-2. They have a fitness advantage. This is why they propagate rapidly through the population. They displace previous variants, okay? But fitness advantage is the proper way to say it. And why they're more fit, we don't know. In this case, they want to know if antigenic variation makes dengue viruses more fit. All right, so they say if an antigenic uh, variation gives it fitness advantage, we would expect greater antigenic distance from recently circulating viruses that correlate with higher growth rates. So in a population, if mm -hmm. high growth rate means infecting more people, it could be because of an antigenic variation. So they looked at an outbreak. They actually looked at the dengue virus population in Southeast Asia from 1970 to 2015. Hmm. So they have serotype wow. measurements for that whole period. 8,644 viruses. And the question is, what's the pattern of the serotypes, right? Do we see, you know, one year one and then another serotype and then another and then back? And so what's going on there? And what they conclude is by looking at these data is that indeed antigenic fitness, what they call it, it's an interesting term, is a major driver of the population dynamics from year to year in a, in a part of the world where dengue viruses uh, are prevalent. And so they say what happens is you have an outbreak of a certain antigenic type and then uh, another the next year, another antigenic type, but that initial immunity contracts and then eventually you can go back to that uh, serotype as well. And they have a number. They say protection drops about 63% each year for the first two years after that first infection. Um, so and then th th this is another interesting point here. So this is antigenic fitness, right? And that's what happens with influenza viruses, by the way. Every year, new variants arise that are antigenically more fit. They can evade antibodies. And that's sometimes we have to make a new vaccine as a consequence. Now, why SARS-CoV-2 variants are more fit, we don't know. It takes some time to do those experiments. I mean, mm -hmm. we're here. We are we're just doing them with dengue, right? So it's really not correct to conclude things about the variants until this fitness issue is, is resolved. It could be antigenic or it could be something else. And we may need to go back to COVID to 2020, 20 years from now, in order to figure out the fitness advantages of how we went from alpha to beta to delta to now Oh uh, this new variant that has made its way to San Francisco. So condensing much of the author's rationale into a few sentences, they elected to test whether or not a vaccine developed a complex blend of several proteins expressed at the time the tick feeds could limit the ability of the tick to transfer a pathogen to, ho to the host. And they fundamentally are asking the question, could a vaccine developed against 19 different salivary proteins from the animal, the tick, form a cocktail of antigens that would ultimately prevent the tick from transferring the pathogen to the host? It's sort of two steps removed. And they offered that the antigens they selected were because of their high immunogenicity immunogenicity, and in most cases, with a known mode of action. So it's not going to cause anything bad to the animal model that they were 
testing it. So, and Michael, enter, if I could just and, give that please, a, um, a descriptive term, um, there was a focus piece published alongside this by um, three authors, uh, and they described that ticks secrete a salivary pharmacopoeia. <laughs> <laughs> So the spit is filled with all kinds of um, compounds that can wonder, um, wonder. suppress host inflammation, pain, blood mm-hmm. clotting, vasoconstriction. So the idea is let's um, give the host a chance to see these this pharmacopoeia in the saliva first and then try to interrupt that stage upon a new bite by a tick. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of the the system is they're using the common mRNA encoding platform. Mm. So basically, they have messenger RNAs, and they're loading them into, for lack of a better term, a vesicle, a lipid envelope. So you have 19 different sets of instructions (laughs) that are going into this envelope, and then you use that as your immunogen. And then what they did is it's very similar to what we all received as a COVID vaccine. They primed with 50 micrograms of the 19 different messenger RNAs, or as a control, they used only one messenger RNA, IL-21, and they boosted twice at four-week intervals. So it was prime and then boost twice. And then they asked the question, were antibodies detected? Well, they got good antibodies or a humoral response in the animal model that they were using were guinea pigs. And they detected good antibodies to 10 of these salivary proteins. And nine of them, they didn't get very much of an antibody response. These results suggested that the uh, mRNA vaccination elicits antigen-specific humoral responses in guinea pigs or antibody production. Next up, as you can imagine, is a challenge experiment. And they simply ask a really simple but straightforward question. Will the immunized animal prevent the tick from feeding? So they took 25 garden variety guinea pigs, or excuse me, 25 um, uninfected um, deer tick nymphs, and they're placed on immun placed on immunized or controlled guinea pigs, and the deer ticks were allowed to naturally attach. So this is a real infection model, and then the guinea pigs were monitored for the development of hypersensitivity or erythema or redness at the bite site, which is an early hallmark associated with acquired tick resistance. And substantial redness was observed in the immunized animals as early as 18 hours after tick challenge. And they have a beautiful figure. And that poor guinea pig, I just want to scratch it in the (laughs) image. It it, it looks so red. Oh, boy. And to drive this point home, um, I was able to communicate with um, three of the co-first authors. Hmm. And um, Andalib Sahid said that, and, and one of the others said that one of their strongest memories from this project was that every four hours they would tr- troop down to the animal room and check the guinea pigs' backs and, and look to see whether <laughs> these uh, little bites had turned into these big red blotches. And then they would walk all the way back from the an- animal facility to the lab where everybody was waiting with bated breath <laughs> to hear, what did you see? And they just said it was so exciting, um, the results, thinking mm-hmm. about how this might work in humans, but also just to have such a supportive uh, work environment um, with their colleagues. So it was a great interdisciplinary effort. And, and these animals were also monitored for the other hallmarks of tick community, namely tick rejection, did the tick fall mm-hmm. off, feeding, and engorgement weights. They actually weighed these little suckers <laughs> because as they accumulated more blood, they got heavier. And and so being small in size and poorly fed in the immunized animals, uh, they many of them died. These poor ticks just starved to death, uh, merely attaching to the guinea pig. And by 96 hours after tick challenge, 80% of the ticks detached from the 
the salivary protein immunized guinea pigs as compared with 20% in the control animals. And it, it's the weights, you know, the, 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 the animals had the ticks in the immunized saliva guinea pig had a mean lower weight of one mm. point, you know, one milligram, whereas the control animal was double that at 2.42. And so they said that vaccination with the salivary proteins in, induces acquired resistance to tick bites in guinea pig. Now, but next up was the essential experiment to answer whether this approach is viable for the development of a vaccine against Lyme. And remember, keep in the back of your mind that these ticks have to be stuck on us for 36 hours to get a full infectious disease. So the question that they ask is, will the salivary immunized animals be able to resist the transmission of Borrelia to the guinea pig. And so they, 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 they did a really clever rationalization. A single infected tick with Borrelia is sufficient to transmit a full infection. So here they placed three ticks onto each guinea pig that were infected. And the rationale, why three ticks, is that since... Most humans don't commonly get three tick bites at the same time. They'd offered that in nature. Many of the ticks may not be infected with Borrelia. So they assumed that three ticks on guinea pigs re represented a substantial degree of exposure to the Lyme agent to effectively address the question, will immunization protect the animal from acquiring um, the tick? And in addition, in this experiment, as humans are likely to remove the tick responsible for the bite, when it becomes red or itchy, they too remove the ticks from the experimental and the control animals in a double-blinded manner when redness became apparent. And at three weeks after exposure to the ticks, the guinea pigs were euthanized biopsies were taken adjacent to the bite site and they fundamentally asked the question was the infection transferred from the tick to the guinea pig in total almost half of the control guinea pigs were positive for transmission of the infection so they had measured it by quantitative pcr that borrelia was indeed present in contrast, none, zero mm. of the salivary immunized guinea pigs were PCR positive. Now, remember, the humans, the technicians are picking off the ticks from this um, control. But to further confirm these results, they also cultured. So we're just not doing PCR. They're asking the question, can they grow Borrelia from a cultured skin biopsy of the guinea pigs and all six PCR positive guinea pigs were also culture positive from the control animals. Since none of the experimentals had it, they of course weren't able to culture any Borrelia. In a subsequent experiment, they allowed the single Borrelia infected tick to feed without removal uh, to mimic an unnoticed human infection from a single uh, tick bite. And here they've again found 60% um, of the control guinea pigs were infected, whereas again, none of the immunized with salivary proteins were infected as tested, as tested by their qPCR methodology or culture. When they repeated the same experiment where three Borrelia infected ticks were placed on guinea pigs. Again, three of the five immunized uh, guinea pigs um, with the salivary proteins this time developed infections. So they just let the ticks sit on there for a long period of time. And if you let the ticks stick, it, it'll eventually um, transfer enough Borrelia into the animal. And they concluded or they collectively offered that their data support that these salivary protein immunization approach 
can indeed protect against tick-borne Borrelia infection when the ticks are removed when redness appears or after simply a short exposure to the ticks. So the redness is a clue as well as the pruritus or the itching. And the host, and then they did all sorts of really elegant immunology. They tested the host to assess um, the antibody responses. And the, again, they confirmed that nine of the proteins did not elicit detectable responses, but 10 of them did. And they um, looked at peripheral blood um, monocytes from the 19 immunized guinea pigs to ask the question, was there a T cell response and were they getting related inflammatory cytokines suggesting that you had a combination of humoral and cell mediated uh, immunity, which we've heard a lot about uh, again, thinking about MRNA vaccines and COVID. We're now all experts on the immune response. And so they also did RNA sequencing where they learned the specific generated genetic signatures associated with the salivary immunization profile in the guinea pig. And the activated pathways that they found from this RNA sequencing included T cell receptor, B cell receptor signaling pathways, chemokine signaling pathways, IL-17, natural killer cell mediated cytotoxicity, FC epsilon mediated sig signaling, and C type lectin receptor signaling all of which teaches us that you're getting the full panoply of the immune response from this mRNA to the salivary proteins to effectively serve as a deterrent from that tick sticking on you long enough to deposit the Borrelia into you. So bottom line for you, this all, the tick immunized guinea pigs with the salivary proteins that were able to protect from tick-borne Borrelia infection when the ticks were removed when redness became pr pronounced. So again, your immune system is an active partner, not only in um, protecting you, but it's also instructing you by the itch and the red uh, to remove this. The time point that they selected uh, was because humans can notice redness or irritation due mm. to a tick bite. And our immediate response is probably baked into our genetic nature is to remove the tick. Now, they offer that when challenged with Borrelia-infected ticks that were allowed to feed until falling off, protection was more limited. Mm. So again, as Michelle opened with, mm. you need to check yourself after a hike for a tick and you you really have to be careful and it's so it's interesting to think about because some of these ticks are very are quite small so you might miss them yeah. but if we were immunized yeah. we might get you know a nasty red swelling around the tick bite and more easily see it but but Man, it's see, interesting. interesting the marketing yeah. will be interesting <laughs> yes if sure. you scratch tick it off <laughs> yeah it's it, that's a that's you, depending on where the tick is, you might not see it, right? No, right. it could be on the back. And, you know, after all, it's exoides scapularis, so it's on your back. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you it's know. Very, uh, very interesting, though. I wonder, yeah. I wonder how long it lasts. That's one of the main questions, right? The durability. Mm -hmm. Oh, not right. Not clear. Yeah, the so durability. Who would get this vaccine? Who would be the, I don't need it because I don't. You don't hike? I don't hike, no. Well, but, but Lyme is endemic in New Jersey, Vincent. You cut your grass. Do you have deer on your property? You bet. Then you're at risk because the, the engorged tick will fall off the deer. And as you mow your leaves. Yeah, it'll quest, yeah. And <laughs> it'll go right in. The tick will jump right into your pant leg or your sock. Sock yeah, okay. line and yeah, okay. this is certainly Got a it. proof of principle, really elegant study. And you can you can tell from Michael's description that this really took a number of um, experts with different uh, training. Yeah. So that as I said, there were three first authors. Um, Andalib Said was is an associate 
research scientist with Errol Fikrig's group at Yale. Um, She had earned a PhD in New Delhi at the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology studying TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, signal transduction pathways. She then came to the U.S. and did a postdoc, a couple postdocs at the NIH, and then was recruited to um, Yale as an associate research scientist to do this work um, in Mm -hmm. 2019. As it happens, she is married to one of the other co-first authors, um, Gonjon Aurora, who's an immunologist, and they've worked together um, since the meeting as PhD students. She says they're a great team. They've published several papers and... They're each other's biggest critics. But Mm -hmm. she says um, Gunshan has also been um, a major motivator for her for her entire career. And she's really thankful to um, Dr. Fickrig for um, the opportunity to work together on this project. Now, another one of the co-authors is um, Jacqueline Matias. She is a postdoc who is the tick expert of the group. And she was born in Brazil in a region that has a lot of biodiversity. So naturally, she fell in love with ecology, biology, got a master's and then a PhD in infectious disease, started to work on ticks and then pathogens. But one of her um, proud moments of her training is that she actually engaged her father in some of her research. Uh, one day, her father said, I think I see some um, cababreas, um, which are these large rodents that are um, uh, indigenous to South America, passing in front of our house. And um, Jacqueline knew that these were um, common uh, hosts of two species of ticks that transmit spotted fever. So they actually um, went and set traps. She and her father set some traps, collected some of these animals, collected ticks, and then found about 10% of those ticks had uh, the rickettsia species that's responsible for mm. spotted fever. <laughs> and this, so they published this about um, her urban area of um, Brazil um, having these uh, spotted fever um, rickettsia. So um, she also met her husband in Errol, uh, Errol's lab, and they were the first couple in the lab. And she can rightly say that papers were not the only benefit she got uh, from doing that research. (laughs) She uh, Mm -hmm. loves to cook uh, when she is not doing her work. And she also wants to um, give real credit to Kathleen DuPont, another one of the authors on the paper. She's a long-term research associate at Yale who taught them how to handle the guinea pigs, how to vaccinate. She was there um, throughout all of the animal work. And um, Kathy is retiring this month. So this... um, beautiful paper is a fine uh, parting gift um, that Kathleen is giving us as she uh, retires. So a couple of them do have some advice for junior colleagues. Um, Jacqueline Matias says, persist in something that can express who you really are. If at some point you don't recognize yourself in what you do, don't be afraid to start over. Time is too precious Mm -hmm. to waste your voice. Find out what you really love. She says, I found my voice. Have you? And then um, back to Andalib Saeed, she says for aspiring researchers, believe in yourself. Research is exciting and frustrating, but keep thinking about how you can improve yourself with every experiment and also live your life. So going back to one of the points that Vincent brought up is fitness. Won't the ticks simply be worried about falling off of people and adapting? Well, humans are an accidental host for ticks. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things I did not present for the sake of time was they actually did this in mice. And the mice don't become allergic to Mm -hmm. ticks. And so the natural history component or the fitness argument is we're actually an accidental host. So one of the really, you know, promising footnotes to this paper is – Can we use this approach to look at other slow-acting pathogen transfers in order to develop an approach to develop vaccines? Because a lot of these agents like Babesia, which offers malaria-like symptoms, um, is is really pretty uh, disturbing. Now, malaria wouldn't be because the mosquito feeds very quickly, but the tick feeds much more slowly. So again, whether or not this mRNA technology will be, you know, immediately investigated for lots of other 
vaccines we've been on the hunt for remains mm-hmm. to be seen. Michael, so, you have any sense if this was begun before the COVID mRNA vaccines? I, I don't, Vincent. Michelle, did you get no. whether this was done before? No, I didn't learn that. Of course, um, the Fickrick lab has been working on Lyme disease and vaccines against Lyme for disease for, for many years. Yeah. yeah, but this is, I really love this approach. Let's um, let's shoot the messenger, as it were. <laughs> Not the message, but the <laughs> let's go after the vector. Shoot the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the it, it, it really was, it was really pretty, it's, it's a really neat story. It's an approachable paper. Even though it has a lot of elegant immunology in it, and I encourage you to go and look at the science translational medicine and the data associated with the immunology are quite fine. Yeah, it's a very, very and nice And the focus I love um, it. essay love it. that comes with oh, the, it is, a, is a beautiful description with very nice schematic. Yes. Lovely. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michelle. That's very nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's... Uh, TWIM number 256. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. If you want to send us a question or comment, TWIM at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and uh, happy December, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Elio Schechter's at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.